I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sriram Rathi from ICICI Securities. Thank you and over to you, sir. Mr. Sriram Rathi, you may go ahead. Mr. Sriram? Yeah, uh, am I audible now? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, and good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of ICIC Securities, uh, I welcome you all. I welcome you all uh, to the earnings uh, Q2 FI21 earnings call of Metropolis Healthcare Limited. Uh, today, we have with the senior management team of the company, uh, represented by Ms. Uh, Amira Shah, managing director, Mr. Vijender Singh, uh, CEO, and Mr. Rakesh Agarwal, CFO. Uh, with this, I'll hand over the call to the management. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Q2 FY21 earnings call. And I hope you and everyone around you are safe and in good health. I'm joined today by Vijinder Singh, CEO, Rafi Chagarwal, CFO, and HGR IR Advisor. The presentation and press release has been, has been issued to the stock exchanges and uploaded on our website as well. I hope everyone has had the opportunity to go through the same. Let me start by sharing with you that we at, at Metropolis Healthcare have been confirmed with the Frost & Sullivan Company of the Year Award in the Indian Diagnostic Services Industry 2020. We have been recognized for our excellence in growth, innovation, and leadership. This is indeed a proud moment for all of us at Metropolis. We are pleased to share with you that Metropolis and its entire employee base has remained committed to serving the nation during the pandemic and worked tirelessly in ensuring that our timely results Yes, and accuracy have been consistent throughout. With leading the industry in terms of commencing RT-PCR testing in March 2020, setting up dedicated teams for COVID and forging corporate tie-ups for testing for the needy, we have continued to improve traction on our overall business. While we may not have been very vocal about the opportunity, considering the unpredictable nature of the COVID-19 business, we have put all efforts in serving customers and that has only strengthened our brand equity. This is truly the strong resilience of the Metropolis team. Let me now move ahead by giving you a strategic lens of the four pillars that we believe will continue to drive our business growth ahead. The first is our growth on the non-COVID piece of the business. After nearly six months of gradual uptake, we achieved 100% recovery in non-COVID PCR business in September 2020. This is a result of our efforts on increasing physical coverage with doctors, opening up of clinics, scaling up home testing services, tie up with institutions and corporates, and all this has ensured we are able to strengthen our business model. We continue to focus on achieving growth in non-COVID business and foresee the business to resume normalcy in Q3. The second is home testing services. We strongly believe that home testing is an important part of our strengthening the Metropolis brand proposition in the minds of consumers. And when it is bundled with large test menus, safety measures, best in class turnaround time, the results fall in line in form of higher growth where home testing services as a percentage of B2C business, excluding COVID, now contributes 19.6% of revenues up from 14.6% in H1. In H2, I'm sorry, in quarter two, this number is closer to 25%. This contribution has been aided by our presence in nine locations currently, which we plan to scale up to over 65 locations by the end of Q3. This is regarding home testing. Number three, the third piece is the digitization efforts that we have built in our brand, which is continuously engaging and communicating with consumers, creating digital partnerships, digital records for consumers, doctor engagement, B2B portal, enabling us to become a complete end-to-end -end digital service provider for not only customers, but for every stakeholder. Happy to state that we have reached an audience to the magnitude of 25 million via our digital communication efforts. The fourth piece is our M&A efforts, which we believe there is tremendous opportunity for, given the large unorganized share in the diagnostics industry and given the need of the consumer to be associated with a strong, knowledgeable brand, which has reach, strong testing capabilities, and safety and trust as part of its ethos. While we continue to evaluate opportunities for small M&A, we are also open and are evaluating mid- and large-size M&A deals. Depending on the strategic fit, scale, and size of business, the valuation parameters could differ. For us, leadership position of the acquired business, brand recall amongst consumers, integration of the brand, and overall health quality of franchise will determine closure of deals for us. Q3 
2 FY21 has been a strong quarter for us. We achieved our highest ever quarterly revenue as well as our best EBITDA margins to date. Clearly, the operating levels benefits played out in the quarter, which were driven by increased utilization of lab and patient visits coupled with superior product mix, increased home testing visits, which reached almost 20% in B2C for non-COVID tests, and this is a better margin profile on the back of many efficiencies on cost and processes that we have built in the service offering. Automation and digitization, which has led to increased cost control and monitoring. And cost efficiency initiatives where we have encouraged innovation and critical thinking lead to operational cost efficiency. And five, increased revenues and economies of scale benefits. Having said this, a contributor to the revenue growth has also been large-scale COVID testing, which is unpredictable, and its contribution going forward is likely to be dependent on external factors. While large part of savings initiatives are sustainable, we believe it is our duty to reward our employees who have worked tirelessly throughout this pandemic. We are therefore announcing revision in employee salaries for their loyalty and support to strengthen the Metropolis grant. <coughs> this will have some impact on margins going forward. However, they will still be strong and healthy. And therefore, our efforts will be more geared towards increasing the non-COVID revenue, of which we believe the following will be the drivers. Increase in elective surgeries as increased number of people will opt for surgeries than what was the case during the peak of the pandemic. Higher number of doctors will open clinics for longer duration, leading to higher patient visits in the doctor ecosystem and therefore diagnostic ecosystem. Number three, Increased contribution from B2G revenues, in our case, NACO and NCGM contracts. Four, shift, shift of testing from unorganized labs to organized labs like us on the back of increased awareness amongst consumers on the importance of hygiene and safety in diagnostic testing. And number five, higher traction from wellness tests, which will open up further as consumers start realizing the need for periodical tests and updation of their medical history. I will now highlight a few points that we believe is an outcome of our continued efforts to build a strong franchise. Number one, we continue to maintain a healthy and improved balance sheet. We are a zero debt and net cash company. We have improved our working capital cycle on back a steady increase of B2C portion of our business. Our cash conversion continues to remain healthy. OCF to EBITDA is at a healthy 86% for H1 FY21. We have seen tremendous response to our digital engagement activities, which has seen a steady rise in website traffic, call volume, and home visits. We continue to strengthen our existing IT systems by rolling out new and improved updates to the existing system, like in-house support for digital platforms, improved health data analytics, and securing information systems through continuous monitoring. Our near-end targets include consolidating our cloud infrastructure and providing robust end-to-end -end support along with data privacy. We are also in the process of finalizing partners for long-term digital transformation in B2B and B2C. While customer focus is key at Metropolis, other important stakeholders are also an important part of our ecosystem. We have spent considerable time during COVID-19 to open and introduce new doctors to the service network, new hospitals and labs have gotten added, and all this will help us create deeper inroads in the end market. Our efforts in testing during COVID have caught off tremendous engagement opportunities with government and decision makers, allowing us to play a more meaningful role in the Indian diagnostics journey ahead. And lastly, increasing employee engagement efforts to digital training models, thereby increasing new benchmarks of performance. Let me conclude that we are through, going through a strong path of growth for non-COVID revenues, coupled with healthy margins and a strong balance sheet, a capable and highly technical team that has stood the test of time in the last two quarters and created a stronger metropolis brand. That's all from my side. I would now like to hand over to Vijinder, to take you through some of our operational grants. Uh, thank you, Amira, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me give you a perspective on our operational parameters. For Q2 FY21, we, we reported patient visits of 2.62 million, registering a marginal growth on year-on-year -year basis. We conducted 4.83 million tests versus 5.2 million in Q2 FY20. Revenue per patient and revenue per test increased on account of high value COVID-19 test. On a like-to-like -like basis, non-COVID revenue per test and revenue per patient stand at rupees 926 and 444 rupees respectively. This meant a growth of 8% and 3% respectively on year-on-year -year basis. This growth has primarily been attained on the back of volumes returning from high value specialized tests. As guided in previous quarter, 
we had announced the one time rationalization exercise to this effect we have continued our rationalization exercise of the bottom pyramid of the network which was counterproductive in our overall scheme of things this one time exercise has largely ended in september 2020 and will lead to better productivity and efficiency as well as improvement in management bandwidth our revenue profile among focus feeding and other cities to that follows Focus cities, five cities, including the city and peripheral area around metropolitan regions, contribution has moved up marginally from 56% in Q2 FY20 to 57% in Q2 FY21 on back of increased testing requirements from urban cities. Leading cities, eight cities, including the city and peripheral area around the region, contribution has moved from 19% in Q2 FY20 to 21% in Q1 FY21. while other cities contribution has moved from 25% to 22% in q2 fy21 our btc revenues in focus cities in q2 fy21 for non covid business has now reached 60% as our brand continues to gain more traction this has been a measure of our efforts to focus dp on ensuring standardization of service levels across touch points consistent doctor and patient engagement focus marketing efforts to all stakeholders and ensuring convenience in delivering diagnostic services through increased home testing services with respect to test mix on volume and value basis including covid-19 tests which are part of specialized tests the volume and value mix for specialized tests has been an improvement we continue to increase our non covid revenue while focusing on increasing our utilization levels of our collection and lab network while our aim is to grow our non covid revenue the overall revenue growth will also depend on how covid shapes up in which which is difficult to predict as of now our as september has panned out we believe non covid revenues will rise faster as situation normalizes across the country our capabilities on testing on back of largest test run and short faster penetration of metropolis brand in geographies will enable us to outperform i would also like to highlight on our hr initiative Ours is a people business, and hence we believe it is our duty to keep our employees motivated and happy. In addition to the revision of salaries that Amira mentioned in her speech, we have also taken a number of initiatives, which includes the Andy Shorey Award for the frontline staff, which a personal contribution from Amira. ESOPs are part of senior management team. Further, we have contributed the employee welfare fund as well as reoriented. all the insurance schemes along with medical testing and provision of medical assistance for employees and immediate family that's all from from my side i will ask rakesh to take you through the financials uh thank you jamdar uh, good evening to everyone on the call uh, let me give you a snapshot of our financial performance happy to share that we have been able to surpass our own expectation that we laid down during our last update On the revenue front, we have been able to scale up revenue from Rs. 68 crore in June 2020 to Rs. 105 crore in September 2020. The revenue growth was strong on month-on-month -month basis. Covid contributed to 35% to Q2 financial 21 revenues, while Covid revenue remained elevated in July and August. It tapered down in September 2020, which wherein we saw higher growth in non-Covid revenues. Accordingly, we reached full recovery in revenues on non-Covid PCR front. and believe this trend is sustainable and will remain our focus area while fulfilling covid testing and subsequent revenues <clears throat> we have achieved record ebitda in two, uh, quarter 2 financial year 21 with margin of 32.9% before csr and esop the levers for this margin include increased utilization level <coughs> and superior product mix which led, led to higher throughput at our labs higher home visits uh, test which now stand at 20% for q2 <coughs> financial year 21 b2c non covid verticals cost optimization efforts on back of automation digitization and innovation led mindset in in our way of doing business as guided earlier our efforts would be towards increasing non covid revenue and therefore it is difficult to predict q3 outlook given the unpredictable nature of covid 19 volume having said that we are confident to grow on y on y basis on non covid test However, with partial rollback in cost saving initiative, as we have guided in Q4 and Q1 calls earlier, we expect some marginal moderation in EBITDA margin going ahead. For Q2 financial year 21, our revenue stood at rupees 289 crore. Q2 financial year 21 EBITDA before CSR and ESOP stood at 95 crore, and margin stood at 32.9 percent. 
For actual financial year 21, our revenue stood at 431 crore, a growth of 1% on Y-on-Y basis. At one financial year 21, EBITDA before CSR in SOP stood at 107.8 crore and margin stood at 25%. Our PAT for the quarter stood at 60.5 crore with a margin of 21%. For H1 financial year 21, our PAT stood at rupees 63.4 crore. We have continued to focus on collection efficiency. Our data days has improved from 55 days in March 20 to 49 days in September 20. Overall working capital days have improved from 11 days in March 20 to 4 days in September 20. Our liquidity position remained very strong with Rs. 325 crore as on September 2020. OFC to EBITDA stood at 89% for H1 financial year 21 versus 86% for H1 financial year 20. Recently, rating agency reaffirmed its crisis AA- minus, that is stable rating on the non-convertible debenture and the long-term loan facility of the company has also assigned its crystal A plus A1 plus rating to the short term bank facility of the company. That's from my side. Now we now leave the floor open for QA. Thank you. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. To ask questions, please press star and 1. The first question is from the line of Anubhav Agarwal from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, one question was on the uh, home uh, testing that you mentioned about 20%. Just want you to understand in your uh, network, some of the home visits will be captured by the central, uh, let's say your lab versus the, uh, your service network. What I mean, just want you to understand what percentage of home visits will, will directly be serviced by the central lab. So we can't hear you very clearly, Anubhav. Your question was what percentage of visits? What percentage of the home visits uh, will be captured by the central lab versus, uh, let's say, captured by your franchises? So majority of our home visits are done directly by the company. Uh, minority uh, will be done by the franchises. Uh, one of the key things that we are trying to accomplish is uh, sort of an operational, uh, you know, standardization of experience. Uh, and therefore, uh, the expansion also that we are doing uh, in terms of the home services uh, to many more cities uh, will be primarily done through a direct model uh, versus through a franchise model. Having said that, uh, the direct model does not mean additional costs on the PNL, uh, as we are doing it through a semi variable model. Sure. So that that's the reason you mentioned that margins are higher for home business because you uh, you don't have to share margin with the franchise there. Right? That's one of the reasons uh, uh, that uh, uh, gives obviously a better margin. And the second question was on the service network as. After the let's say reorganization, restructuring this uh, service network, you have about 2450 center sites now. When you think about this, let's say over the next two years, three years, what kind of number are you thinking about? Uh, I'm just trying to get a direction. Would you be like uh, less than what you are today, or would you be like 3500 or 5000? I mean, what kind of number you're thinking about, let's say two, three years on the line? Sure. So, so I think in H2, uh, we are looking to add about 150. Uh, centers, uh, which have already begun the expansion, uh, and I think in 21-22 we are looking to add about six to seven hundred uh, centers. Uh, I think the general uh, trend will be to continue to expand, um, you know, uh, six hundred to eight hundred centers uh, per year. Uh, give or take, you know, it could be a little bit more, a little bit less, but that's the approximate range. Uh, so we will continue with our brick and mortar expansion. Uh, we do not believe that that is going to in any way compromise, as we said. Uh, Rationalization exercise that we did from uh, April to September was a one-time rationalization and consolidation after three years of expansion, uh, just to maintain hygiene in the system. And we have already now finished the rationalization and started our expansion again. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chandramoli Mutia from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, and thank you for taking my question. The first question is a slightly broader industry question. 
in recent weeks, industry participants have pointed to COVID testing potentially being a recurring business line over the next quarter and beyond. But with increasing optimism around the potential approval of a COVID vaccine, how do these developments influence our strategy for COVID testing business going forward? See, our view has always been, uh, and you would have noticed that Metropolis probably has not been uh, extremely vocal on uh, COVID being, uh, you know, either a big driver of business or not, because at the end of the day, we believe that this is uh, not completely influenced by us. As we know, pricing is influenced by the government. Uh, volumes are dependent on uh, a cure and therapy and vaccine. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have sort of kept a, a neutral stand quarter to quarter. Having said that, um, as you have seen, what we just announced, uh, we and Metropolis have done the maximum COVID PCR business uh, in Q2, which has just gone by compared to any of our peers. Um, so I think uh, going forward, I think regionally we see a changing pattern of COVID. Uh, in parts of West India, we are seeing COVID infection fall uh, currently, but that doesn't mean what's going to happen in November, December, we don't know. But in October and parts of November, we saw it fall, but we saw it increase in other parts of the country. Uh, so I think regionally, you will continue to see uh, highs and lows in different parts of the country. And depending on, uh, you know, where which market we are strong in, we will be able to uh, absorb that opportunity or uh, not fully. Really. So I think the COVID opportunity continues to be alive, uh, but it will uh, be unpredictable in its uh, lack of consistency uh, quarter to quarter as it will come in different geographies. Also, as the vaccine comes to market, uh, antibody testing and PCR testing will again become very relevant. Uh, we don't know what the effectiveness of these vaccines are practically yet. And people who get the vaccine will again need to check whether they have got the antibodies or not, uh, along with also people who continue to get infections as things open up. So yes, the opportunity is alive. Uh, we continue to expect it to be there uh, many quarters to come. Got it. That's helpful. Uh, second question is on the margin line. So could you talk us through what the different factors are in this, you know, 400 basis point sleep? I think we've, we've been doing pre, you know, COVID close to 28% range. Now it's at a 32% range. Uh, as business trends move towards steady state, do we think some of this margin expansion we've shown is sustainable? I understand our wage costs may step up starting 3Q. Uh, we did 28.5% I think last year in 3Q. So do you think a 30% margin range is something we can aspire to on a sustainable basis? Well, I think there were three things that really contributed to the margin expansion. Uh, one is the factors of economy and scale. Obviously having growth of about 29% or 30% growth uh, you know, with the same uh, similar fixed costs and similar variable costs have also added to that. The number one point in terms of the margin. Uh, number two is the uh, is the changing mix of channels. Uh, as we alluded to, our home visit channel has gone up, and we believe the way we are building home visit has a better margin profile, uh, and what we will continue to do, and therefore that has aided with the increased ratio of B two C and through home visits. Uh, the third, I think, has been really good work done by the team in terms of cost management, uh, not only on uh, manpower costs, uh, where there has been a lot of productivity done. Uh, but also on using digitization and automation, as we have been indicating for the last three quarters we are going to do, uh, to really help uh, streamline not only manpower productivity, but other costs as well. Uh, and therefore, we are seeing some of those benefits uh, coming to play um, in, in the cost management uh, as well. Uh, we believe that most of these costs that we have reduced uh, will be sustainable. Uh, there will be obviously certain things which in the long-term interest of the company are advisable to do, like obviously giving wage increases and, you know, things which are normally required in the business. Got it. Got it. That's helpful. And just one housekeeping question, if you could share with us the RT-PCR and antibody testing revenue split and volume numbers, please. So the antibody testing uh, for us is a, is a smaller component uh, compared to the PCR uh, testing. Uh, and we have found that the um, antibody and antigen testing is about 3.5%. Uh, Rakesh, you want to come in with some uh, more information on this? Yeah, 3.5% is right. That we have done 3.5% of antibody and antigen test, and the uh, rest of the tests are basically on uh, RT-PCR. Okay. So the RT-PCR number percentage is 34, 34 to 30, 34, 35%, yes. Got it. We continue to see much, this as a, as a big opportunity uh, you know, for Metropolis going forward uh, on the antibody side. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you.
next question is from the line of Bharat Seth from Quest Investment Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, congratulations on excellent set of number. Yeah, I have just one question. With this PCR, PCR testing, the patient which has been tested COVID positive, so there are a lot of tests associated with that, which could be of a one-time nature. So can you give some color to how much is that and which may not be re repeated once the COVID is out? See, there are certain tests which are for many different uh, infections and diseases. So, for example, uh, uh, there is a test called D-dimer, I think which is what you're probably referring to, uh, which is actually an indication of whether there is any potential heart disease caused by COVID. Uh, now, these tests obviously are prescribed not only for COVID, but they're prescribed for many different uh, infections or disabilities or, or uh, uh, problems, illnesses. Uh, so these are what we are calling as uh, COVID rub-off tests. Uh, and there is a group of such tests which are getting prescribed more during COVID, but they were getting prescribed even before COVID. Uh, so we don't have a separate quantification for that because it's very difficult to determine, uh, you know, what is being prescribed only specifically for COVID or without for other reasons. Uh, and therefore, we only look at the COVID antibody and antigen separately along with PCR, uh, and those go into the non-COVID bucket. Any color directionally has that kind of a taste gone up substantially during Q2 because of uh, COVID? Uh, they have gone up significantly, yes. Um, uh, I don't have the exact quantification for this. Okay, okay. But it's not a very it's not a very large number that makes you feel that uh, uh, if COVID uh, you know drastically falls, then that entire revenue is going to get wiped. So it's not a very big percentage. Yes, the pie, the pie which is there for this test are very small, you know, overall numbers. So it's not a very big pie for us. Uh, obviously, the number may have gone up, but still, if whatever number has gone up, that constitutes a very small pie in the overall thing. It's a very low, low single digit kind of a number. Okay, thanks. And second question is, uh, with this now opening up a whole, I mean, unlock opening. So what kind of, I mean, uh, on organized to organize, I mean, opportunity we are seeing, and what kind of offer are we getting for consolidation or merger and acquisition? Sure. Um, see, unlike some other industries which are very heavy laden with debt, and therefore you are seeing a lot of distress things happening, that is obviously not the case in healthcare. Uh, right. the, in, you know, the, the entry barrier in this industry is very small, and therefore you don't trend, generally tend to see people who have got too much of debt. What we are seeing is that actually there are sort of uh, three levels of labs, and, and I'm happy to run through each of them. The bottom level is where you have got almost 99% uh, or 95% uh, of the industry, or you can say 90 to 95 of the industry are in the entire market, which are the independent mom and pop labs, of which majority tend to be run by non medical people, and very few, only 10% are run by pathologists, right? Now, okay. in those uh, laboratories, uh, anyway, they were not very compliant, their cost base was very low. Uh, and they didn't have many costs, and therefore we are seeing that while they continue to struggle, uh, you know, obviously healthcare being badly defensive, they have come back to about 60, 70, 80 percent of their uh, normally normalized revenues compared to the year before, and therefore they are making less profit, but they are not uh, under some very heavy stress or load that they have to set. Uh, also, okay. they tend to be very, very small. They tend to be one or two lakh rupees per month kind of revenue. And therefore, obviously, these are labs which we have no interest in buying. You then have the uh, second layer of labs, uh, which are the regional players, which have actually grown and become strong in one city or in two cities or five cities in a particular geography or in a particular region. Now, like this, there are only about 10 to 10 to 15 such labs all across the country. And therefore, there is a, they tend to be very scarce. Some of them are not built in a good way. Some of them are built on heavy discounting, bad practices, and we have obviously very little interest in buying. The good quality franchises, the good quality business franchises, have been built on uh, good practices, good, uh, you know, good quality of business, and those are very few. So obviously, we continue to evaluate any such opportunity that comes our way. And as I indicated in the speech, we are very open uh, to doing also mid-size or large-size acquisitions. 
uh, and we continue to explore all such opportunities along with smaller acquisitions as well. Okay. Thank you. That's a great offer. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chetan Gindoria from Alpha Accurate. Please Hello, ma'am, and uh, congratulations for a very good set of numbers. Uh, and my question is uh, with respect to our EBITDA margins. So I uh, understand that with the operating leverage benefit uh, and the cost savings, our EBITDA margin has gone up in this quarter. Uh, so uh, so why, when this COVID revenue is gone, uh, say it comes down over next two years. So uh, can we and the uh, non-COVID revenues again scale up? Can we expect the industry overall industry margin and your margin also to move up to the 30% kind of a bracket? In industry, there is no such thing as an industry margin because every company has its own unique business model, uh, and therefore, depending on their product mix and depending on their channel mix. Uh, and the quality of business that they do, how much they discount, they don't discount, and what are their prices. Each person's EBITDA margin has a different potential. So I, I, it's very difficult to comment on anybody else. But if I can comment on Metropolis alone, uh, we believe that if tomorrow COVID, next year COVID is not there at all, uh, you have already seen us having historical EBITDA of about 28, between 28 to 29%. Um, and we believe that if we are able to execute uh, the things that we are looking to execute, uh, there is potentially an upside uh, in terms of margin profile. Uh, whether we will want to uh, continue to just build margin or reinvest that margin into uh, better uh, growth opportunity, I think it's a decision we'll make at that time. Uh, you know, maybe we'll continue expanding the centers aggressively uh, because we are already at a good margin. Uh, so we'll take that decision, I think, closer. But yes, definitely, if we are able to execute what we are planning, there is an opportunity for a margin upside. Okay, okay. Uh, and just to follow up on that, so uh, is it is it safe to assume that our current fixed cost structure and our current facilities can uh, support a much uh, higher level of uh, non-COVID revenue? That is right. Uh, I mean, we have seen, for example, our existing infrastructure support, um, you know, an additional 40% of growth uh, just in the month of September, 45% of growth in the month of September through the same infrastructure. Uh, so I think that should indicate that the answer is very clearly yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, ma'am, and all the best for the uh, coming quarters. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Anmol Ganju from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks for taking my question and congratulations for a great quarter. I have a couple of questions. One is that uh, when you guys uh, characterize uh, COVID revenues, are you also taking into account the associated tests like D-Diamond or they would be classified under non-COVID revenues? It would be when we are talking about COVID PCR revenues, we are only talking about COVID PCR, not okay. any other test. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, the second question is around home visits. So uh, the B2C uh, revenue uh, comprises of around 20% of home visits uh, this quarter, 19.6% is what you've put on the presentation. Uh, what did this number look like, you know, either previous quarter or the corresponding quarter last year? Uh, any any uh, color on that? I think it's Rakesh, it was 14.5% Q2 yeah. last year, right? So, yeah, Q2 last year is 14.5%. From where we have moved to 25% this year. I'm talking about retail B2C. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Third, Amira, if you could just throw some light on vectors of realization growth, because you know one is obviously home visits are a high realization, so is COVID. But what's happening on realizations uh, in the uh, in the in in the in the portion of the revenue which excludes that, uh, what are the opportunities in terms of pricing uh, given people's preference for higher brands and you guys also enhancing the experience? If you could shed any light on you know, some of the more sustainable vectors of pricing growth or realization growth, that would be helpful. Well, Virinder, you want to take that? Yeah, Virinder, I'm just going Hello? Yeah, Anmol, can you repeat uh, the question? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I was just trying to understand, you know, uh, what are some of the vectors of uh, realization because we've seen, uh, you know, fairly healthy realizations. So one is obviously COVID, but and the other is home visits. But if you could just, uh, you know, throw some light on how this uh, looks like for next uh, four quarters or more sustainable yeah. trends, there that will be helpful. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, overall, uh, if you see last uh, quarter one versus quarter two, home visit services have definitely. Uh, you know, given uh, given us a big spike, and accordingly, we have done our cap capacities capacities boosting up as well. So this is going to continue, and as a from strategic point of view, also we want to really invest behind this uh, home visit services. And beyond that, in order to make it much more robust, we want to also add a little bit more, you know, features to this. Uh, not just a diagnostic, but uh, but something related to other other pieces also from from wellness point of view. So this is going to continue in in our next term. Uh, uh, your strategy as well. Plus, but but important here is that uh, we've seen in quarter two there has been a good traction on the footfalls as well. So that is what you know. Amira also mentioned that in in H2 we plan to add another 150 centers. So primarily these two things are going to be our key strategic point: uh, home visit uh, uh, and then number two is opening up of centers. Uh, and more just to add to that, uh, you know, the, if you see our even keeping aside COVID, our revenue per patient has increased uh, about 8% uh, from about 850 rupees to about 925 rupees approximately. Uh, and this is not including COVID at all. What we have seen is that the mix of specialized testing has come back uh, to about 39% in Q2, uh, which was obviously lower in Q1. Uh, and approximately the same percentage contribution it was last year uh, as well. So as the specialized work comes back to normalcy, uh, we hope that the uh, realization per patient uh, will get benefited uh, by that. Um, but, you know, obviously, as we have maintained before, uh, our goal is not to keep uh, only increasing the realization per patient, uh, but actually also to get enough volume for the system. Uh, so it is a fine balance between... Uh, uh, like we said, our EBITDA margin economy is a scale operating leverage that we get and reinvesting it into growth. And at the same time, the expansion that we get in, in revenue per sample and reinvesting it into volume. Uh, so the idea is to maintain that healthy balance between the two and not just focus on any one KPI to keep maximizing only profit or only revenue per sample. Okay. Thank you. That's extremely helpful, uh, Amira. One last question before uh, I get back to the queue. Uh, so you spoke about, you know, uh, that there are not enough targets because of the fact that you guys are choosing in terms of what you will pick in terms of an asset. But have we seen that, you know, last couple of quarters of disruption has at least pushed the uh, organic market share of the long tail that the industry has to you and in that sense are you guys growing faster than the industry because i can't imagine that you know uh, that, that that such a period of disruption for the industry won't be beneficial to you guys i can understand that you know there might be uh, assets that you might not want to pick up because of uh, you know hygiene reasons and other fitment reasons etc but is there a greater acceleration of market share shift than what we saw same time last quarter for example no, I mean, I think what the feedback we get on the ground and, and common sense, uh, like you rightly said, tells us that there is definitely a move of, of people moving from unorganized to more organized brands like us. Uh, having said that, uh, unfortunately, there is no hard data available of the industry from any third-party provider that allows us to validate that uh, in any quantifiable way. Uh, so while I can tell you it is what we are seeing on the ground, uh, but uh, you know, there is no robust data points to back that up. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we hear from our teams is yes, and also, you know, obviously there have been only about 200 labs across the country out of 100,000, which have had the capability to do COVID testing. Uh, and with the heightened visibility that COVID testing has gotten, it's very natural uh, for consumers in their mind to separate now labs who have the advanced capability of doing COVID versus everybody else. Uh, so I do believe that there will be a natural move uh, to do this, but whether it's already happened and at what pace, it's very difficult to, to know. Thank you. That's helpful. That's helpful. That's it from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Praveen Sahai from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, many congratulations for a good set of numbers and uh, 
the award uh, you guys has received. Uh, so my first question is uh, related to uh, the volume. Like uh, as I can see in the presentation, that uh, the September month the sales has been due by a six percent non-COVID business. And uh, so and also in the last quarter we had observed that uh, realization has improved significantly. So how is the situation right now in the month of October? Will that our volume has a back to normal uh, or uh, still we are, uh, you know, degrowth? So um, can't obviously comment specifically on, on October numbers at this point, but overall we see a trend of uh, non-COVID business continuing to uh, grow quite well. Uh, obviously, there will be penalty factors which will come in, uh, in, the, in this half of the year. There will be some months which have more festivals and holidays and some months which have less, which is quite difficult to our business. Uh, but generally, the trend is that non-COVID business is increasing. Again, it depends on state by state. There are some states which had never ushered in a very strong lockdown. And where things were normal from day one. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you never saw such a slump in business in the, like in, you know, in Q1. Uh, but like there were some states which uh, actually completely shut down their states and therefore there became a psychological barrier for people to step out. So I think regional to region we are seeing a different reaction. But overall the trend is that non-COVID is definitely increasing. Volumes are increasing. Um, and, you know, is it 100% normalcy everywhere? No. Uh, but generally that is the trend. Okay. And uh, second on the rationalization, uh, as you had mentioned, this is a one-time rationalization effort uh, in the three years of expansion. So how old uh, these, uh, uh, you know, centers uh, in the system which were closed? Jinder, you want to take that? Yeah, so these were primarily uh, last two and a half years average, but uh, these are generally the centers which have been, which were opened in, in in other uh, city categories, which we call as ARCs. So these ARCs operate from smaller towns, and uh, we thought that it's, it's, it's good that uh, we should sort of you know, rationalize those centers who are not uh, completely loyal, who are not following certain specific protocols of the company. So it was spread over uh, last two and a half years' uh, uh, centers okay. from each okay. point of view. Okay. And last question is related to the seeding city contribution, which is uh, now picked up 221 percent. So, uh, can you give any directional comment on this? Uh, how much of the target uh, contribution you are expecting from these cities in the next uh, uh, two years or three years' time? See, if you look at it, we have three three categories of cities. One is focus, where there are there are five cities in this category, and our one of our endeavor has always been to increase our B2C ratio in these cities. And what we shared the data due to our B2C ratio in, in, uh, in these cities have reached to 57% if I include COVID. If I exclude COVID, then the contribution is about 60% on B2C. So this probably is going to be our key focus area. And in future also we'll continue to, to improve, uh, improve this B2C ratio in these cities. So, but uh, the seeding city, how much uh, that 21 percent you continue to do so? That's or uh, because that's I think there is a B2B is a focus area or a contribution is the highest. So, how is that going forward? No, no, I think I think important uh, for us would be to look at you know focus cities where our contribution is high, and then from from B2B perspective, uh, it's it's it, it, it's good uh, that we focus uh, on in, in, in focus cities for for B2C. On on feeding uh, cities, we have two different kind of markets where there are certain markets where our B2C contribution is high. There are certain markets like like North India, Delhi or Calcutta where our focus has been more on to on to B2C side, which will continue to to move. But definitely going forward, we want to, as I mentioned just in, in one of the questions, that we want to really invest behind home visit, and these are the markets where I think home visit will create a platform for us to get into B2C um, area in these markets. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Neha Manpuria from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, Amita, uh, on the home health care, uh, you know, uh, business that we're planning to invest in, is there, is there an opportunity cost uh, on the volumes that we get on this business? I, while I understand that because we're doing it on our own, the profitability might be higher, but 
uh, wouldn't these volumes uh, ideally be a walk in into your franchising center and therefore more a cannibalization and growth rather than new volume? Or am I looking at it the wrong way? See, I think uh, in, in healthcare business, there is, you know, the way we see the business is, you know, you, like in other industries, you may categorize and say, oh, these are brick and mortar traditional and then there are new age companies. Uh, in healthcare, uh, my strong belief is that there is not going to be this division at all. There are going to be some healthcare companies which move towards being new age, which means being more asset light, being more digitally mature, knowing how to, how to have handle an omni-channel strategy, and most which will actually not have the ability to make this transition. And the one, those of us who are able to make this transition will be able to capture new consumers, uh, new customer profiles in a strong way, but both models will continue to exist. So there will continue to be the traditional brick and mortar approach, which is going to continue to be majority of healthcare business. Uh, mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there will be this more new age uh, digital slash home service piece, uh, which will come on as an extra piece that will get added on. Now, will there be cannibalization between the traditional and the new? There is bound to be some amount of cannibalization, like there has been in other industries, be it retail or something else. Uh, but the opportunity cost of not doing it is far worse than the opportunity cost of doing it. Um, and I think overall, if we look at these two together, uh, mm -hmm. we believe that we will continue to expand our market share uh, and expand our brand in the mind of the consumer. Uh, and thankfully, not in a uh, fashion where we are losing margin, but in a fashion where we are gaining margin. Uh, so, you know, in our mind, it's a must-do uh, versus an optionality. If I, if I were to extend the question a little bit, you know, given that some of these regional players have become particularly strong during COVID, uh, you know, with the uh, large uh, increase in revenue that we've seen, uh, the unorganized to organized shift, uh, could, this, could there be a case that they benefit more than the large players do? Uh, and the second part of the question is, uh, how difficult is it for a regional player to, you know, scale up home healthcare, or do you think uh, the digital piece of it makes it, uh, you know, a, a bigger uh, tool for the larger players than the regional players? That's a good question. Uh, look, I think the regional players, which were already strong in certain cities, have definitely benefited during COVID. So whether they have benefited more than the Pan India players or less is, is very difficult to gauge because obviously these are all private entities which uh, we are, mm -hmm. don't have access to uh, information. But they have definitely benefited like we have benefited. Um, uh, do they have the ability to roll out digital slash home services? Yes, they have the ability. The question is, do they have the right management teams and do they have the right mindset? And I think the fundamental issue that we have seen with any of these companies who have tried to scale is two mm -hmm. challenges. The biggest challenge is that most of these tend to be uh, doctor-led and managed, uh, and therefore their ability to uh, commercially scale up uh, as a business with systems and processes tends to be uh, maybe not as strong, uh, mm -hmm. and therefore usually are, are not able to cross borders and move from the city that they are strong in to new cities. So they land up making a lot of profit in their core city, but don't necessarily have the ability to scale from a geography perspective. So they might have gotten stronger in their own city, but I don't see them necessarily having now the ability to become regional or to become planet. Understood. Understood. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sushmit Patodia from Motivators One. Yeah. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Amira, a few couple of questions, um, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, first is, uh, you know, I was just uh, thinking about, we speak to a few insurance companies, they are now saying that COVID test uh, is a test that they are also getting done. Are you seeing business coming there and is that a uh, stream of revenues that you think uh, can be sustained? I think mostly insurance companies are doing it uh, uh, in behalf of, in some cases, TPAs are doing it on behalf of their corporates that they are tied up with, uh, or in some cases, insurances are doing it selectively. So far, we have not seen this becoming a significant okay. uh, source of revenue. Corporates, yes, it has become much larger than before. Uh, but insurance companies specifically, we have not seen it become a very large piece yet. Okay. 
And uh, secondly, uh, you know, just from a, a, a think thought perspective, uh, do you think about new tests which can become five, ten percent of your revenue three years, four years down the line? Like, uh, you know, we we see this with consumer companies thinking about new products becoming a certain percentage of revenues uh, down the line. Uh, if you can tell us how you think about this, um, or first of all, is it relevant in diagnostics? You know, we see certain products uh, definitely gain uh, traction. Uh, there's usually never a black swan event that's happened like COVID that has just uh, taken one product to the top of the list like it has uh, in the last yeah. uh, six months for any diagnostic firm. Uh, traditionally, yeah. what happens is a test takes a long time to gain acceptance among doctors. Uh, for them to start prescribing it for their patients. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a few years journey, uh, not an overnight uh, situation. And therefore, the same reason, it's difficult to dislodge those tests from the top uh, list of the, uh, you know, the topper list. Uh, so we expect right. to see COVID definitely as a topper, I would say, for, for a few quarters to come. That, that right. version of, of uh, COVID may change. For example, today we are doing a COVID PCR. Uh, tomorrow, if a saliva-based test comes, which is of a different technology, that may replace the COVID PCR. But COVID as a product, we definitely expect it to continue to top the list for a few quarters. Right. Okay. Uh, so you don't think internally about uh, you know developing a new test which can become ten uh, percent. Uh, we develop tests right? all the time. So in our yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, we okay. talked about yeah, we, we develop tests every quarter. But what I'm saying is that those don't move to the top of the list. Uh, in a short no, not the time, top. Like I mean, five, ten percent. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Got it. Even Got it. even they don't even become five, ten percent. They'll they'll oh, see okay. a very sort of small percentage of the revenue. If you look at the four thousand varieties of tests we do, uh, yeah. you know your top, uh, you know, thirty, forty, fifty tests will contribute mm. a significantly larger part of part of your revenue uh, compared mm. to the tail end of your test. Got it. And uh, the third question, uh, you know, now that you're on the expansion. Uh, uh, path again uh, on these service centers. If I were to see your 16 to 20 journey, your centers are up 60% CAGR and your B2C revenues are up 20% CAGR. Is that a fair uh, uh, proportion to think about when you expand, let's say, 6X in the next five years? I'll give my comments on Vijinder can add to it as well. Uh, usually there is a gestation period for a center to start breaking even and making money, whether we set it up or whether a franchise sets it up. Usually we see about a year to year and a half as an operational take even period uh, for a franchise when they set up a, a APSC, uh, patient service center. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, and obviously that's assuming that it happens in a focus city when Metropolis brand is, is reasonably strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it takes about almost uh, four to five years for it to come to some sort of maturity. Uh, that is usually the gestation period because when you set up a center, it's not a, a pure OTC product. Uh, you're actually going in there and right. going to all the doctors in the area and going yeah. and trying to move them from the unorganized players to your brand uh, in a systematic way. Uh, and doctors who've had relationships for 30 years in other labs take their own time to move. You have to also create a visibility in that area with your patient. And therefore, while you may set up the distribution in an expansion phase very quickly like we did, it doesn't mean the revenues will flow at the same percentage, but they will definitely take a longer time to, to flow. Like I said, maturity is four to five years. Right. Uh, so, I, I mean, I just wanted to understand that, uh, you know, if, if uh, centers go up, let's say, 6x in five years, uh, the top line should go up uh, at least uh, two to two and a half x in that five years, because that's been the track record for the last four years. That's been the track record, yes. Is there anything you yeah. want to add to that? No, I think I think uh, way forward, definitely uh, a company like Metropolis is going to get you know leverage or benefit uh, primarily because now people are more aware about hygiene and safety. And our strategy on on this expansion is basically talks about going closer to patient. Now during COVID, why you know why it is important because people may not like to travel to far far distance. Of course, they would have an an option of home visit, but of course they can also visit to the nearest you know uh, outlet, which is which is like a Kiryana shop. So I think going forward, uh, definitely this is going to help us a lot in in terms of in terms of going closer to patient. Right. And just last uh, question before I get back into queue is any thoughts on radiology? 
uh, has anything opened up because of this crisis? Uh, any change in that uh, towards that segment? Um, I think uh, nothing. This is a significantly long-term opportunity. I think short-term uh, radiology centers, who obviously demonstrated an ability to be safe and hygienic, uh, you know, during the COVID crisis, gained over the unorganized uh, because it's so uh, driven by a sort of brick and mortar and it's not as scalable as pathology in terms of home services, etc. Yeah. Uh, but the general mindset around radiology continues to be the same, uh, which is on high-end radiology, which is on PET scans, on MRIs, on CTs, that we don't like the uh, financial, uh, you know, uh, profile of the business. We don't like the the hygienic slash unhygienic practices of the business. Uh, we are okay with the low-end radiology, which is X-ray, ECG, etc. And that is an area that we may continue to explore, as we already have in many of our centers. We may continue to expand. Thank you, and best of luck, and uh, uh, happy Diwali to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Agarwal from Ingrid Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. Just to start with few clarification, the realization for non-COVID, which is 925, essentially includes uh, antibody antigen tests, is it? Yes. Uh, when we separate out uh, yeah. COVID, but of course, antigen and antibody tend to be much lower. Uh, usually, antibody test uh, realization is much lower than this, including antigen is much lower. So, if anything, it decreases the average realization, not increases it. Okay, okay. And secondly, when Rakesh said about 3.5% being antibody antigen and 35% you know, being RT-PCR, I didn't, didn't really catch that number. What does that really mean? Rakesh, you want to clarify? Yeah, so basically, what we are saying is whatever revenue we are projecting for Q2, the that, that revenue constitutes 35% of COVID-PCR revenue and 3.5% of antigen and antibody revenue. Of the total sale reported? Yes, yes. Revenue reported, yes. Okay, perfect. And okay, so my first question now essentially is, uh, you know, as Amira mentioned on the growth driver going forward, I just wanted to delve a bit deeper on that. Could you help me understand within the focus and seeding cities, which are the markets where you think uh, in the growth would definitely be higher uh, in terms of, you know, next three years, if we take that kind of horizon, uh, you know, could you help me understand how will Metropolis look in terms of test mix? or a share of B2C on the overall business, not in focus cities and wellness. Uh, just the broader picture of the company overall over the next three to five years will be really helpful. So on the B2C part, as you know, the KPI that we always look at is B2C in focus cities because looking at it overall in the business depends a lot on what the contribution of other areas are. So that you know, we feel is a wrong uh, KPI to follow. So I'll continue to tell you, uh, you know, the B2C in focus cities. As we have said so from day one uh, in our PIC as well, that our goal is to get to 65% of uh, B2C in focus cities. Uh, we have, as, as of this quarter, reached uh, 60%. Uh, and we started from uh, mid 40 So we think we have come, uh, you know, very, we've done great progress on this. And we will continue to march forward towards this goal. Uh, we will expect to see uh, focus city growth. Uh, on B2C continue to be uh, uh, very positive, and we'll also expect seeding city growth uh, to be positive. Um, the, if you look at focus cities again, it's got two parts: it's got B2C and B2B. Uh, you know, when you focus on B2C, uh, you're naturally saying that B2B is not necessarily going to give you as aggressive a growth in that particular focus market because not necessarily, but sometimes they tend to be slightly in conflict with each other. Uh, so in focus cities, the goal is definitely B2C uh, growth, which will be uh, the area we will we will really prioritize. Uh, in seeding cities, it will be the overall growth that we will prioritize. And we hope and consider to see that both of these will continue to have similar percentages uh, that they do as now. Uh, because we are also seeing the other cities, which is of a low, low base, are also growing quite aggressively. So just a matter of arithmetic, uh, you know, we don't expect to see a drastic change in as a contribution you see now. Two to three years from now, you, we don't expect to see a drastic change uh, in any of the contribution metrics. As far yeah. as the test yeah. product mix, uh, similarly, um, as you see, our routine semi-specialized and specialized uh, have been going in a certain direction, and we expect that will continue. 
we expect the semi-specialized teeth uh, to keep moving downwards, but not in a hockey stick approach, but in a very gradual uh, move down. And we expect to see routine and specialized in a gradual move upwards. Okay, okay, perfect. And the last thing you want to add to this? Yeah. I think you're right. Uh, absolutely, I see overall, if, if our B2C ratio goes up in focus cities, like Amira said, that in three years from now, we want it to be at 65, that automatically will change the whole B2C ratio at group level. Right, got it, got it. And lastly, uh, if you could give some kind of direction on the non covid business for the second half as in could we uh, you know could we see like 15 20% yoy growth or we see like more like single digits i mean if you look at our uh, historical things before covid happened uh, you see that our uh, you know uh, 18 17 18 18 19 our growth was 18% and 1920 was was obviously impacted by the last fortnight so we were on trend for about 16% uh, non covid uh, and I think, uh, you know, we were reasonably comfortable with those numbers. Uh, so, you know, I don't see any reason why it should fall to a single digit code. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll come back in the queue and wish you a very happy Diwali and a prosperous new year. Thank you. Happy Diwali to you, too. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Bharat Shah from ASK Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah, Bharat Shah from ASK Investment Managers, uh, just to correct. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, some kind of a shape of an emergent integrated uh, health system probably is beginning to emerge, uh, whereby, let's say, uh, all the players in the healthcare system kind of uh, get linked together. So whether hospitals and nursing homes, then the medical fraternity, doctors and uh, the fraternity, uh, diagnostic chains like yours, uh, medicine uh, dispensers, uh, and uh, insurance firms. Now, B2C, brand-driven business, more profitable, consumer-oriented, builds equity uh, without any question. But uh, over the period of time, aggregation of the health chain as an entire uh, system uh, would make it inevitable for many different constituents to play along. Uh, any thoughts on that? Sure. Um... Look, I, I don't disagree with you. I agree with you that over time, uh, we expect to see a more integrated approach in healthcare where all arts and chairs, stakeholders of the ecosystem, ideally, should come together. What I'm actually seeing is the government is actually driving the agenda of uh, through the uh, National Digital Health Mission, of which I'm a part of the committee as well, of really being the uh, super highway which uh, connects all the different stakeholders in the ecosystem, at least from a perspective of storing data and keeping an interoperability of data when a patient moves from X hospital to Y hospital or goes from one diagnostic center to the other. And I think if that happens, then the government becomes a key um, a storage in charge uh, or at least a platform in charge of allowing a consumer to control and own their own data along the way. I believe this will be a good move because it will make life easier for the patient and easier for the doctor to make a clinical decision. Now, that's one piece of it. The second piece that's happening is there are a bunch of players who are trying to create health platforms for the consumer and the patient to say that, look, we will help you store your records, we will help you, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, choose your doctors, et cetera, et cetera. While that is an aspirational uh, project, uh, on the ground, we have not necessarily seen uh, that take off in a huge way. While teleconsultations did increase uh, in the last six months, uh, the kind of teleconsultations that increased were mostly Zoom calls uh, that doctors did from their own telephones with their own patient faces. Uh, teleconsultations through third-party platforms have not gotten as much traction and even if they have, they have not necessarily become revenue generators, but they have become more uh, a sort of free feature that consumers are using because they have the opportunity, because so, you know, so platforms are providing it. So whether this uh, marketplace is going to go on to become 
uh, something that changes the consumer and doctor behavior, frankly, is too early to tell uh, at this point of time. But the integrated approach of healthcare players coming together through what the government is trying to do and through free market will definitely happen. I hope that answers your question. Sure. Uh, no, my my, uh, that's exactly the point I was kind of making. That national digital health mission uh, seems to be the first attempt to uh, kind of aggregate. Uh, first of all, uh, data pieces are loose. Uh, then you intelligently bring them together. You store them, create systems, make them interoperable, and then uh, the first signs of a more sophisticated system which can link everything can emerge. So it was uh, uh, basically from that perspective. So uh, yes, that does answer. Uh, second, uh, technology increasingly will not just be the bread and butter and converting routines into efficiency or the ease, but it will be mm, uh, uh, not just a business advantage or a competitive advantage, but may become inevitable and uh, a significant differentiator. So from that perspective, artificial intelligence, data science, uh, data analytics, mm, again, an emergent uh, project, uh, nothing in the uh, immediacy. But over a period of time, uh, you know, unless one thinks about it today, uh, uh, those kind of things uh, will take longer time uh, tomorrow to shape up. Therefore, predictive diagnostics, uh, greater capability to engage and create a true brand equity. Uh, 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 your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Uh, so there's again, you could see pieces of it. And, you know, there are obviously a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, interesting concepts, but some of them also land up becoming buzzwords, and we are trying to make sure that we just differentiate between the buzzwords and what we genuinely believe will help us uh, do better in our business. So there are two areas that we genuinely believe will help. One area is, um, you know, creating this uh, digital ease from a patient and consumer perspective, right? And how do you create engagement uh, like they have in other facets of uh, their life, be it retail or be it banking or be it telecom or whatever else, and how can we create that ease of working with Metropolis and engaging with us? So that's number one. The second is the other stakeholders uh, in the ecosystem. How can we make life easier for them to engage uh, and therefore make them more addicted uh, sort of to the Metropolis uh, brand? I think these are very clear opportunities. Now, on the back end, uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about machine learning, uh, these are good concepts, but the question we have to bring is, well, where is the advantage? Now, tomorrow, can we use the data and the knowledge base that we have harnessed as a group uh, and use it to improve the quality of uh, clinical diagnostics that we are doing using artificial intelligence? Absolutely. It's possible. Do we have the data sets which are ready? Do we have the knowledge bases which are ready? The reality is there are no companies which actually have it. They have to be built. So while we do have some amount of data on the back end, uh, you don't necessarily have the uh, pathologist who's today sitting and looking at reports and deciding whether, okay, this is a positive or a negative or a normal or an abnormal. How do you capture that pathologist knowledge and put it into a computer and enough data of that and therefore create artificial intelligence? I think it's the journey that all of us will have to go through as diagnostic players. What is the end goal of that? The end goal of it is that are you able to reduce your manpower cost on pathologists and be able to replace it with AI? Uh, today, if you look at the cost of pathologists as a percentage of our total cost base, it is not very significant. Uh, and therefore, I'm not sure whether this particular thing from a productivity basis is going to impact us in a large way in the long term. From a quality of diagnostic basis, can it help? The answer is yes. So there are efforts on our side to work on some of these projects, which we believe will be slightly more mid to long term, but the work has already begun uh, in terms of what we are working on at the back. Sure. Now, because artificial intelligence, while the, um, uh, the label is stuck, but it's uh, increasingly becoming more synthetic rather than remaining on the artificial. And to that extent, I think the strides being made are probably faster than uh, uh, one may uh, wish to acknowledge. Uh, uh, the last uh, part is uh, 
uh, more mundane, uh, were any of our technology systems were attacked uh, because there have been a lot of malicious attacks and in a business that we are in and a very sensitive field, um, particularly malicious attacks can leave us vulnerable. So have there been any attempts, uh, malicious attempts within the country or from outside or anything significant experience and uh, kind of a, a path to protect oneself from? A good question, Barbai. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think there were uh, definitely attempts at attacks on our system uh, in uh, August and September. And uh, we are happy to report that uh, none of them were successful. Uh, our systems were uh, strong enough to thwart uh, any such attack. Uh, having said that, uh, this is an area of continuous progress and improvement. Uh, hackers are getting smarter, and therefore, as companies, we need to get smarter. Uh, and therefore, we have uh, additionally, as an extra precaution, uh, also engaged uh, you know, information security, data security experts to come and work with us in this quarter. Uh, to evaluate and audit uh, all our systems uh, and help us to become even stronger. Uh, but, you know, we've been happy that at least whatever attempts were made, uh, thankfully, was, was uh, not successful. Yeah, just on a lighter note, uh, hackers are not getting smarter. Actually, while they are probably rascals, but uh, they are among the smartest lot of people. <laughs> Correct. And thank you, Amira. Thank you very much. We'll be able to take one last question. The last question is from the line of Anubhav Agarwal from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. A couple of clarification, Amida. One is this service network that we have today, what percentage of the revenues roughly comes from them? I'm, I'm talking about like once the non-COVID business is normalized, or let's say maybe in fiscal 20, what percent revenues we are getting from them? Isn't that you want to take that? What kind of press is asking? I'm asking what that percentage uh, of revenues are coming through our uh, third party network? Oh, uh, yeah, third party. In fact, uh, the contribution has been, you know, back to normal actually, what we used to have pre COVID days. And in Q2, uh, we've seen uh, good traction on, on third party. As I said, primarily, uh, since as I mentioned, that our strategy has been going closer to patient. I think somewhere down the line, uh, this expansion is helping us a lot in terms of, you know, where the patient doesn't want to travel uh, far distance, so it is coming down and using our third party centers. Thank you. Yeah. But within that, what would it be as a number? Like, uh, is it like less than 10%, uh, 20%, some, some uh, quantitative no. metric you think? I think, I think, I, I think it's, it's, I can tell you that it is more than double digit, but uh, in, what we should look at is how, how third party centers are growing. I think there has been a significant growth uh, coming from third party, at least in last quarter. Okay. And just uh, one more question on your lab network utilization. What kind of percentage utilization you uh, total uh, processing capacity you are at? Right? Let's say, for example, tomorrow there is a surge in antibody testing. How are you placed for that? So I think the first is that if you look at last uh, four to five years, we have not expanded our, 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 our lab network. It is still at 124 labs, uh, only marginal increase. Uh, and and uh, with uh, so much of expansion on third party, I think we've been able to sustain the the, the growth. What what growth has come on account of uh, the the expansion, and primarily because we had enough sort of capacity at the back end, and still uh, we are capable of handling any sort of you know growth. Like Amira mentioned that in the month of September, we had a growth of about 45 percent, and we were able to service uh, through our current uh, capacity. Yes. Specifically on COVID antibody, uh, luckily out of our 125 labs, I think uh, quite a large number have got the capability of doing immunoassay testing, which is a technology required for COVID antibody. Uh, and therefore, we don't think that, uh, you know, we, we feel like we are quite well set to be able to take advantage uh, of antibody as a scale. And of course, the, you know, it depends also on what TAT is going to be required. Usually, this is not a uh, a critical test where you have to give a result in two hours or three hours. Uh, but we believe we have the infrastructure ready for that. Sure. Uh, thank you. That's helpful. Just one last clarification. Your app now has improved dramatically, the digital app. What percentage of tests uh, typically are you working through the app now? 
So currently, it's still small because the app, as you know, the improved app has only been launched uh, recently. We believe there's still a lot of good things to come. Uh, and we will now be actually pushing it as we move forward. Uh, currently, the digital acquisition is happening more from a corporate portal um, uh, thing versus the app. The app is also contributing to it, uh, but it's still an insignificant number. Uh, as we move forward, we will be happy to share uh, by the end of the year some more details uh, on the digital side of the business in terms of uh, acquisitions, in terms of you know the distinguishing between the portal, the app, etc., and give you a little bit more visibility on a granular level. Sure. Thank you. I'm done with my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference back to the management team for closing comments. So I thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, you know, we hope everybody continues to be healthy. Uh, you know, as a company, we're happy with our set of numbers, and most importantly, uh, we continue to be excited for the next quarter. Uh, we think we're on strong financial fundamentals. Our operating parameters are getting better thanks to the digitization and automation that we're doing. And we are back into uh, expansion mode as far as our network expansion and home services uh, distribution goes. Um, and uh, as we said, we continue to evaluate uh, you know, good opportunities in M&A. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, we will be able to uh, you know, make one of those happen uh, sooner than later. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, and, um, you know, I think I um, uh, just want to make sure that uh, sort of everybody is, uh, you know, fully aligned with us when we say that we will continue to put our best foot forward as far as COVID uh, testing, whether it's antibody, antigen, or PCR testing, all the new technologies that come in, and of course, continue to push the non COVID business, which is completely uh, in our influence uh, to be able to do that. Uh, thank you again, and a happy Diwali and New Year to all of you. Thank you very much. On behalf of ICICI Securities Limited, that concludes the conference. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. You may now disconnect your lines.